delighted to welcome you to our second geography event of the semester. We had Jerry Pratchett pop-up breakfast with Jerry Pratt oh, cool. last week. Okay. Isn't it? Don is a distinguished professor of geography at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. He is the uh, recipient of many, many wonderful honors. I'm delighted that Don's here. We'll have a reception afterwards in our lounge, and um, but we'll have right. time for questions afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm thank taking the book. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you where in the book it comes from. It actually comes from lots of places. It, it's, um, I, it's, I'm delighted to be back. I wish it were under different circumstances. Um, and uh, it's, it's sad. It's actually very bittersweet for me. Most of my uh, ideas about labor and landscape were formed when I was working with Neil at Rutgers 20 years ago and longer. And, um, and so uh, the, the ideas that eventually became the lie of the land, which were my, my dissertation about landscape and labor together, uh, were formed there. And they were formed there in part because I, I really wanted to understand the landscape uh, from the bottom up, from uh, the role of workers in producing the landscape. I think what I ended up doing was writing a very top-down dissertation and book anyway. Uh, but it, it was what my goal was, and it came out of a particular moment. And I'm still trying to do that, and I'm still writing a lot of top-down stuff, as you will see. Uh, but that spirit is always there, and it was very much imbued uh, when I was at Rutgers. And so, like I said, it's, a bit, it's, it's very bittersweet to uh, be here under these um, circumstances. I think you'll, see, you'll hear a fair amount of uh, Neil's influence in what I talk about today. When um, Cindy uh, said, oh, by the way, since you're coming down, can you give a talk? I said, yes, as long as I can do one that I have in the bag, uh, at, which means it might be a little longer than you were hoping for. But as was it Shaw who said, I would have written you a shorter letter if I had had more time, right? That's the same kind of thing. So hopefully I won't go uh, too long. I'm going to talk about, if I can get there, the Bracero program, uh, which, as many of you probably know, was a guest worker program in the United States from 1942 to 19. 64. It ended in December 1964. And um, it began as a war emergency um, project. And apparently, the war emergency lasted until December 31st, 1964. And it went through lots of different permutations. And over the course of its history, about 4.5 million separate contracts were signed. Not 4.5 million men were brought in, but 4.5 million separate contracts were signed uh, to bring uh, Mexican men to uh, the United States uh, in the very early years to work both in agriculture and on the railroads and after 1945 in, uh, in, the, uh, in agriculture alone. By the 1960s, uh, more than 60% of all the Ceros were working in California. It's one of the reasons why the, the program ended, as I will uh, suggest in a little bit, was that uh, it lost a lot of political support around the country because there's this huge subsidy to California growers uh, so that they could then outcompete um, growers in other states. And so it lasted until 1964 when it was, it was finally done. I'm going to be talking about the end of the program here. And the title, the long title for a long book with another long title, uh, will make sense as I go along and talk a little bit about landscape theory at the end, as you will see. We often think the most important question concerning landscapes is how they change. And in fact, last May, I was in Sweden, and I organized and took part in a symposium on revolutionary landscapes, which rather evidently was centered on uh, just this sort of question of change. Change or the struggle for it uh, was taken as a given, and that was what was in need of explanation. And for any of us who want to understand the dialectical landscape, who want to take a dialectical approach to landscape, these kinds of questions of change are really important. As Bertel Ullmann, the great theorist of both alienation and dialectics, argued 20 years ago, change is a constant. Things, stuff, relations are always in a state of becoming, and they are thus always in the throes of change. This is self-evidently true. But I think it's only one side of the coin. And those who were in the class just a little while ago know that I only think this is one side of the coin. Equally important, um, not only, but certainly especially for understanding the landscape, is the question of persistence. As Ullman himself argued, non-change is one of the things that has to be explained. Persistence matters. Solidity and stability are fact of life, even in a world in which, which that is always in the throes of becoming. So the question that I want to raise this evening is how the California agribusiness landscape has been able to persist. 
whatever the fact of constant change and whatever the pressures for its partial or total transformation have been. So consider in this regard the insights of the geographer and artist uh, Trevor Peglin in his brilliant book, Blank Spots on the Map. And if you haven't read it yet, you need to have it done by tomorrow morning. Geography, Trevor says, sculpts the future. The spaces we create pl place possibilities and constraints on that which is yet to come because the world of the future must quite literally be built upon the spaces of the past. To change the future then means to change the material spaces of the present. And what's the prospect of that? For of course those material spaces of the present, the landscape has often been constructed in someone's interest. It serves a purpose. And for that, that interested someone, it is worth fighting to preserve. To change the future, therefore, means to fight against those who do not want to change the material spaces of the present. The persistence of landscape, as much as their transformation, is a function of ceaseless struggle. In 1939, many in California thought that the agricultural landscape organized through a highly industrialized, massively exploitative, deeply corporate set of social relations was on the cusp of revolutionary change. More than a decade of worker unrest, including strikes of a scale never seen before in agriculture anywhere in the United States, a deep economic crisis and a new willingness by the American people and Californians in particular to continents increased government planning, involvement, and even ownership over systems of production, distribution, and consumption pretended a massive transformation. And with war on the horizon, it was clear that business as usual had to be surpassed. Something new had to be created. Something new that encompassed all the relations of production up to and including the landscape that supported it. But that landscape itself, of course, placed possibilities and constraints on that which was yet to come. And that landscape definitely served particular and indeed highly organized and politically powerful interests. Revolutionizing the landscape was going to be a fight. And it was a fight that the revolutionaries lost. They lost it in large part because powerful growers were able to convince the federal government to develop a program for the importation of guest workers from, Mex from Mexico, workers who in fact were indentured. Known as braceros, which is derived from the Spanish brazos or arms, millions of Mexican workers were imported over the course of the program, which as I said lasted from 42 to 64. All was meant to be, and in fact legally defined as, supplementary workers. Indentured braceros came to dominate Calif the California agricultural labor market. And as I argue over the course of a long book, um, because it is a long book, everyone who's read the book so far has had one comment, it's long. So as I argue over the course of a long book, it was precisely the presence of Braceros as a controlled, flexible, and unfree labor source, a labor source that one economist called government-administered labor market insurance that made um, it possible for California agribusiness to persist in remarkably unchanged form in the post-war decade. It persisted, but at the same time, the power of corporate farming, and especially of financial capital in agriculture, deepened. Between 1950 and 1959, which was the heyday of the Bracero program, farmland in California increased by just over 800,000 acres, or for those of you who think metrically, 320,000 hectares, or about 2%. The number of commercial farms declined, however, by 32% from just over 99,000 to just under 67,000, while farm value increased from 200 to 245% of the national average. And per acre, uh, per value per acre increased from a whisker under the national average in 1952 to 232% of the national average in 1959, and farm income jumped from 206% per, of the national average to 260% of the uh, national average. Average farm size in California increased almost 40% to 371.6 acres. Meanwhile, the number of farm hands in California declined 11%, due largely to mechanization in cotton. Instead of a massive uprooting of the industrialized agribusiness that many had prophesied in 1939, California instead saw in the wake of the war and in the wake of the mass importation of indentured labor, a deepening of it. 
a consolidation of power based on the spaces of the past, rather than a new future in which worker rights and self-determination might have had some purchase, the primary dream of the 1930s revolutionaries. The story of the historical geography of the Bracero program, the specific struggles that went into, uh, that allowed the landscape and the systems of industrialized, capitalized agriculture to persist, is an intricate one and to me it's deeply fascinating. It implicates deeply geographical questions of social reproduction, labor process, mechanization, scale, power, property, violence, the state, and the ongoing struggle of deeply disenfranchised workers seeking to make a life in the fields of what Richard Walker has described as the second most productive agricultural landscape in the world behind the tropical rice growing regions. It involves malfeasance and dirty dealing by growers, both large and small, by state agents charged with overseeing the program, by operators of labor camps and cookhouses, and by doctors and insurance agents. It involves acts of resistance, large and small, organized and not, by braceros, by domestic workers, by students critical of the program and made to pay the price, by clerks working for uh, large agribusiness concerns and appalled by what they witnessed, and by union activists. And it involves diplomatic negotiations at the highest levels of the state for both Mexico and the United States. The un I, uh, the, and as well as the unending question of uneven development between the two countries and the always malleable politics of immigration. This picture, in fact, is from Operation Wetback. The Mexican guards are trying to pull the guy into Mexico. The American guards are trying to pull him into the United States. I'm pointing at this, which you can't see. <laughs> the Mexican guards are pulling him into Mexico, and the Americans are pulling him into the United States at a time when the U.S. is deporting hundreds of thousands, actually thousands, tens of thousands, tens of thousands of uh, Mexican workers and, and families uh, at the time. But what I want to focus on today is another moment of potentially massive change, which was the end or the demise of the Bracero program in, in the 1960s in order to examine in a bit of depth the question of persistence within a world of change. What I'm going to ask was the prospect for industrialized capitalist farming and for agricultural landscape as an increasingly powerful coalition of forces sought to bring the Bracero program to an end. In 1959, despite the consolidation of power the previous decade had seen, the prospect for farming in the future when the forces arrayed against the Bracero program seemed to be gaining strength was complex. Even though it, was, it is in the interest of those invested in the landscape to preserve it, and to that is to preserve those investments. The survival of capitalism as a whole is predicated on the continual production of new spaces, as Henri Lefebvre outlined and as Neil nailed down theoretically. It is predicated on the continual transformation of natural space, inherited absolute space, into productive relative space in Neil's formulation. A transformation that has now been supplemented by the continual reworking of that relative space, that is the geographical landscape. A process that becomes increasingly bound up in the struggle of the capitalist class to ensure the survival of capitalism. Yet pushed right up against this necessity is the very fact that capital is already fixed in space, in those 99,000 farms consolidated into 67,000. Capital was already sunk into the landscape, now fixed in a space dependent on a ready supply of braceros. It was precisely access to indentured braceros that allowed for the landscape to be capitalized. And it was a landscape, as I show in some detail, I think, in the book, that was built for braceros, largely to the exclusion of domestic workers, who now literally could find no home in it. Domestic workers at the time referred to any worker who was not a bracero. So they, they could be of any ethnicity. Uh, they could be uh, documented or undocumented. They could be citizen or non-citizen and, and so forth. So domestic was this catch-all category of anyone who was not a, a bracero. Sculpting a capitalist future in the California landscape on the brink of the 1960s therefore required the growers, that growers find ways to produce new spaces, but especially ways to assure that the landscape persisted. There was a huge amount at stake. The differentiation of geographical space, the production and reproduction of specific landscapes, as Neil has put the point more generally, is 
a direct result of the need inherently, inherent in capital to immobilize capital in the landscape. It's all very well that 500 million can be whizzed around the world at the push of a button, but it must come from somewhere. You can tell how dated this book is. Only 500 million? The, the first uh, place that that 500 million must come from is, of course, the production process itself. Profit has its origins in the exploitation of living labor, as David Harvey has pressed home time and again. But in order for that exploitation to occur and to recur, a whole world, a whole landscape, has to be in place. And it has to be maintained for some definite period of time. The prospect for growers of a radically changed future, for, ex for example, the loss of their indentured braceros, was not just a prospect of more expensive labor and diminished rates of exploitation, but a prospect of a landscape made radically redundant. A death of capitalism, perhaps, or at least locally to this grower, that canner, or some particular farming town, if not universally. It was a prospect of radically devalued fixed capital. Such would be the case, of course, unless there was an equally radical reorientation of systems of labor procurement or of the labor process, including the technological ensemble through which labor works, or of the productive and reproductive landscape itself. None of these options were, of course, cost-free, and none of these costs were evenly distributed. The circulation of capital, as David Harvey notes, is unstable, and the prospect is frightening. Prospect means, among other things, an extensive or commanding view of the landscape, as well as that which is visible from a place or a point of view, a scene, a landscape. The prospect is both a view of the landscape and the landscape itself. And it is both the act of looking out on the future and the future itself. And to prospect is to find the possibility of wealth in the landscape. As the demise of the Bracero program seemed a real possibility in the early 1960s, the prospect facing many California growers was not necessarily one of continued value. The landscape had been consolidated and expanded in the 1950s through the holding down of wages and the ratcheting up of the exploitation that access to Braceros allowed, but also through a disinvestment in the landscape of social reproduction that set the terms of this exploitation through heavy grower investment in new technologies such as pesticides and their aerial application, through expanded irrigation, and through new modes of packing and marketing fresh produce, and in some crops through mechanization, all investments made po and disinvestments made possible in part because Braceros allowed for such a radically reduced wage bill. But with the prospect of an end to the access of this supply of cheap and controllable labor, the prospect of landscape's future prosperity, that is, what California farmers prospected for, was anything but clear. It was not clear just where in the landscape new wealth might now be found, or under what conditions. Would the death of the Bracero program, should it happen, threaten the survival of this kind of capitalism in the field? The spaces we create, to return to Trevor Peglin's formulation, in the years we created, in the years since the first Braceros arrived in California at the end of September 1942, were now a critical part of the landscape. What kind of future would or could be sculpted from them? These were questions that faced not just growers or the bureaucrats who oversaw the Bracero program, but the workers themselves, whether imported Braceros or domestic workers seeking work in a landscape now historically dominated by Braceros. For them, what was the prospect? The Bracero program officially ended on December 31st, 1964, but its demise was a long time in coming. Migratory farm workers are notoriously hard to organize, and the history of California agriculture is littered with failed or only momentarily successful attempts. The creation of the Bracero program in 1942 made labor organizing that much harder for a large range, a range of reasons, uh, stemming, uh, ranging from provision in the international agreement governing the program that made it difficult for Braceros to join unions, 
to the ease with which growers were able to use braceros illegally as strike breakers, to the fact that braceros were so successfully deployed to push domestic workers out of farm work, creating a whole class of laborers that progressive reformers at the time started calling displaced persons, in conscious echo of the displaced persons of Europe following World War II, and thus who, as uprooted people, were impossible to tie into locally based labor unions. Nonetheless, the American Federation of Labor charted the newly formed National Farm Labor Union, later called the National Agricultural Workers Union, in 1946 and sent organizers to California to try to unionize. The NFLU met with some early success, especially in organizing a strike against the massive DiGiorgio farms that began in 1947 and lasted for almost three years, ending in defeat for the union but which led to a greater recognition of the union's cause. Mostly, though, the NFLU struggled. It struggled for the reasons that I just mentioned, the difficulty of organizing domestic farm workers in a landscape increasingly dominated by indentured viceros, but it also struggled because of poor strategic decisions by union leaders on where to focus their energies, an ongoing unresolved debate over whether to demonize braceros, as well, um, as well as a growing army of undocumented workers, or to enlist them, a deep-seated anti-communism that hampered solidaristic engagements with the Packing House Workers Union, and inconsistent funding from the AFL and later AFL-CIO. By 1951, a crucial year in the Bracero program, a year that saw Congress pass with little opposition, a law that placed the Bracero program on statutory footing. Between 47 and 51, it operated illegally, in fact. Um, and that for all intents and purposes made the Bracero program permanent, even though the war emergency that had given it birth had long since passed. In 51, the NFLU had retrenched and with occasional temporary additions was reduced to a single paid employee in California, Ernesto Galarza. Galarza was in fact a remarkable organizer and scholar, and not one without, but not one without his flaws. And besides that, California is huge and many farming corporations were multi-regional running lettuce and vegetable operations in, for example, the Salinas Valley along the central coast. It's, I'm just proving I'm a geographer. Um, <laughs> along the, the central coast and the Imperial Valley in the southernmost inland desert. Or tree, tree fruit orchards north of Marysville in the upper reaches of the Sacramento Valley and cotton and grape branches south of Bakersfield at the very southern extremes of the San Joaquin Valley. A one-man union, Ernesto Galarza, was no union at all. For the most part, therefore, Galarza confined himself during the mid-1950s to both agitating against the continuation of the Bracero program, though in essence now a, a permanent program, its authorizing legislation had to be renewed every two years. And the international agreement with Mexico that governed the program was also frequently renegotiated. Between doing that and advocating on behalf of Braceros trapped in their iniquitous relations of labor, as well as advocating for the rights of domestic workers displaced by Braceros. Galarza was in fact indefatigable, but he was also pretty lonely. Even so, his importance in agitating against the program and in keeping growers and their allies within the state and federal governments on the defensive cannot be underestimated. And if I really was going to talk about the landscape from the bottom up, I'd keep you here all night talking about it. But instead, it will just have to suffice to say that by the end of the 1950s, after having endured a series of bruising interunion struggles in which the NFLU and AWU was progressively weakened, Galarza had pretty much been sidelined within the larger American labor movement, and farm worker organizing in California was languishing, even as the political situation in California was rapidly changing with the election of progressive labor-friendly Governor Edmund Pat Brown in 1958 to replace the conservative anti-union and grower-friendly administration of Governor Goodwin Knight. In 1959, the AFL-CIO decided to revive its efforts to organize California farm workers and chartered the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, or AWOC, to replace the NAWU. AWOC got off to a very rough start. Its organizers ignored advice from innumerable veterans of California labor struggles that the only way to make inroads into organizing domestic farm workers was to simultaneously focus on settled out Mexican Americans, the most important faction of the domestic labor pool, 
and engage in community union building rather than strict business unionism focused only on the workplace and agitate against the Bracero program. Instead, they focus their attention on the shape-ups, the day labor markets in the agricultural towns and cities that served a fading class of older white and black migratory workers. Nonetheless, as the harvest of 1960 unfolded, AWOC la launched an impressive wave of strikes across the length and breadth of California, the most important beginning in late December in the winter, labor, le winter lettuce harvest in the Imperial Valley and stretching into the first months of 1961. The strike was long, violent, and important, not least because of growers' continued ability to deploy a massive army of braceros as strike breakers. In the end, workers gained very little in this and the other strikes of that year, while growers lost equally little, and maybe gained much in their ability to control the fate of the landscape and their profits through the strategic uses of braceros at that moment. So given that, the FL-CIO withdrew support from AWOC in 1961, so only two years later, seemingly leaving union organizing in California languishing, except for this. The withdrawal of official AFL-CIO money, uh, money meant that union and community activists were able to gain control of AWOC and reorient its efforts toward community-based social movement unionism among, unionism among Mexican Americans that they thought was vital. They were also able to align it with a growing coalition of forces, including the National Sharecroppers Fund, which had long been a patron of the NFLU, NAWU, several Catholic organizations, including most prominently the National Catholic Rural Life Conference, other religious organizations like the Council for Christian Social Action, the Quakers, and the Commission on Social Action for Reform Judaism, civil rights organizations like the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and progressive organizations like the National Advisory Council on Farm Labor, which had banded together to fight for an end to the Rosero program and more generally for radical improvement in the lives of farm workers. The coalition was important because even as the strike in the Imperial was coming to its end in March 1961, Congress was considering renewal of Public Law 78, the Rosero program's authorizing legislation which was set to expire on December 31st, 1961. And agribusiness was already on the defensive. Previously, Public Law 78 had been set to expire in June 1961, and as hearings on its extension opened in March 1960, growers expected they would be able to easily engineer a two-year extension as they had each time renewal had came, come due in the past. But this was not to be. The growing coalition of anti bracero forces was able to upset this expectation, and the program was saved only through a six-month extension. As the December 1961 deadline loomed, growers pushed this time for a four-year extension, an idea that had little support, especially given the recent election of the liberal Kennedy administration, with considerable support from organized labor. They did win, however, a two-year extension to December 31, 1963, though with a new provision that Braceros had to be paid at least 90% of the average farm wages in the state or nation, whichever was lower, and that growers had to make reasonable efforts to secure domestic workers at wages, standards of hours of work, and working conditions comparable to those offered to foreign workers, which sounds like a protection of domestic workers' rights, but which in fact totally reversed the logic of the Bracero program, which had originally required that Braceros be hired under conditions comparable to domestic workers. So there's a flip there. President Kennedy reluctantly signed the extension into law. At least he said he was reluctant to do it. Even so, the forces massing against the Bracero program seemed to be growing in strength, while the national pro-Bracero pro pro coalition seemed to be unraveling, in large part because the Bracero program was, as I mentioned, increasingly a California program. In 1959, the high point of Bracero importation Texas and California together accounted for about 75% of the Braceros employed each month. By 1962, with the mechanization of cotton harvesting advancing, Texas Bracero use plummeted rapidly, as it did in other cotton states, from nearly 123,000 Braceros contracted in 1960 to just over 33,000 two years later. Meanwhile, California's usage grew from about 113,000 to almost 116,000 500 over the same period. In 
California now accounted for 60% of all imported braceros. By 1964, California accounted for 64% of braceros used during the peak harvest week. Indeed, California employed four times as many braceros at its peak week than did the next highest state, which remained Texas, at its peak. Politicians around the country wondered about the viability of supporting an increasingly unpopular program that disproportionately benefited one state, especially as, for various reasons, the national AFL-CIO revived its commitment and its money for organizing in California in 1962. And especially as, also, the Bracero program was plunged into a spectacular scandal in August 1962 when a clerk from one of the Imperial Valley's most prominent firms, the lettuce grower RT England Company, which had operations also in the Salinas Valley and Arizona's Yuma Valley, swore in an affidavit that under orders from that firm's owners, she had falsified payroll records during the previous winter's harvest. The falsification was designed to make it seem like Braceros were earning less than they actually were while doing peace rate work in advance of a Department of Labor audit of piece rate earnings that it was going to use to set minimum hourly wages. Under a threat of being fired, the bookkeeper lied about the hours and days worked, amount harvested, and more. Eventually, investigators, investigations sparked uh, by this affidavit would, would reveal wage doctoring malfeasance in at least seven un other very large firms, all major Becero users, as well as widespread other abuses in the program. The investigations, which were well covered in the national press and which came hot on the heels of an extensive California investigation, which had shown a deep-seated corruption in the California state agency that administered the program in that state, the federal investigation extended into 1963 when once again con congressional hearings opened on the extension of Public Law 78. The ongoing investigations into corrupt practices in the Bracero program, and they were extensive, the growing power of the anti-Bracero pro-farm worker coalition, the concentration of Bracero use in California, and thus other states eroding support for, for the program, all had their effect. In May 1963, the House of Representatives voted to let the program expire on December 31st, 1963. After considerable lobbying, including by the Mexican government, which feared, that the lo feared both the loss of both revenue and remittances, revenue from remittances and political unrest if the program was abruptly ended, and lobbying by the former pro-worker, Governor Pat Brown, who had more than once felt the sting of the growers' political power in the first years of administration, the House of Representatives reversed itself and joined the Senate in agreeing to extend the program one more time, now until December 31st, 1964. But this truly, finally, was going to be the end. California growers now faced loss of access to more than 100,000 indentured workers imported from Mexico under highly controlled conditions with much of the cost footed by the federal and state governments. Organized opposition to the Becerro program had led not just to the demise of the program but perhaps to threatening the agribusiness landscape of, in California altogether. The prospect for growers seemed grim. How they were going to sculpt a future out of the spaces built for indentured workers was uncertain. Facing this grim prospect and, uns and uncertain future, growers began to seek out controllable workers wherever they could find them. Even before it was clear the Becerro program would finally be killed, California growers began lobbying Congress and the Immigration and Naturalization Service to expand Section H2 of Public Law 414, which allowed for the temporary importation of labor under the auspices of the INS. To this day, as we know, H2 programs provide significant numbers of workers to American agriculture and other industries, but then H2 was in its infancy and its value as a vehicle for reconstructing the grower's dream of heaven, as Bracero critic Kerry McWilliams once called the Bracero program, was unproven. Other experiments included the development by the California Farm Placement Service of a series of what were called day haul programs to bring workers from the cities and suburbs into the field, week haul programs that brought unemployed urban residents into the fields for extended periods of time, and seasonal haul programs to bring Mexican-American farm workers into the state from Texas. All experiments proposed originally during World War II, but vehemently opposed by growers themselves then, because they knew that the braceros they were going to get would be a lot more tractable. 
The latter of these programs, the seasonal haul program from Texas, failed even before it started because Texas workers refused to travel to California for the wages and especially for the living conditions that had been, that had been set by more than 20 years of access to indentured Bracero labor. They also didn't want to abandon their families and by now there was little room in, California, in Cal the California labor landscape for family labor since over the era farm worker housing had been steadily remade to accommodate single braceros to the exclusion of other farm workers. By now, in other words, it was nearly impossible to provide the labor force the landscape required unless it closely resembled the labor that had been made available by the bracero program. So experimentation continued. Some growers pinned their hopes on recruiting college students now that the California university system was switching to a more flexible quarter system. In fact, the California Grange, a growers association, thought male college students would be ideal because, I'm not making this up, they would be used to living in the kinds of collective quarters built for braceros with multiple bunks, shared toilets, and a considerable amount of mess. They would not require wall-to-wall -wall carpeting or harmonizing drapes, in the words of the master of the Grange. Other growers pinned their hopes on the Secretary of Labor's newly announced plan to create hundreds of A-teams, that is, high school athletes in temporary employment as agricultural manpower. A hope dashed when the earliest A-teams recruited in California ended their stint in the fields in a highly publicized protest because growers employing them laid them off just before the season ended to avoid paying a five cent per hour end of season bonus, a classic tactic they had used with the Braceros. In each of these cases, the targeted labor force was single men, which growers over and over argued they had to have because there was nowhere to house female or family labor, to which the prominent anti bracero program activist and critic, the Reverend James Visitor of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference, responded at a congressional hearing. Family housing, this is, I've, we'll catch up with family housing, they, they, the growers say, is not available. Of course not. When they thought they could forever count on getting braceros, the growers in California and elsewhere tore down what little family housing they had. And then, because citizen workers with families would not accept jobs where there was no housing, the growers demanded braceros because no domestics are available. This, to me, sounds like the son who murdered his parents and then pleaded for mercy because he was an orphan. During the several years when it was becoming increasingly obvious that the Bracero program would eventually have to be ended, the growers made no efforts to develop family housing, nor to take advantage of the several federal programs which could have helped uh, them to do so. Other farm, workers ad advoca farm worker advocates argued that the problems of both prophesied labor shortage and shortages of appropriate housing could be solved if minimum wages were increased to a level high enough to A, compete with industry for good workers, B, allow workers to purchase lodging for themselves and their families on the open market, and C, to cover their other reasonable costs of reproduction, a proposal staunchly opposed by growers, especially the largest 4.9% of the state's farmers who employed 61% of uh, the farm labor in the state. For them, the wage bill was perhaps the most critical part of the operation. And already in 1964, before the end of the Bracero program, total wages had started to rise, up 23%, according to one account. All manner of changes were afoot. In California in 1964, the number of foreign farm workers averaged 28,000 a month and comprised 12.4% of the total farm labor force. They comprise a lot more of the seasonal labor force, but this is just of the total. In 1965, the number of foreign farm workers was cut by an order of magnitude to 2,800 a month or to 1.3% of the workforce. At the same time, total farm employment was decreasing, a trend that had actually started in 1955, even as the domestic seasonal workforce was increasing. More people were working shorter jobs. And labor processes were changing fast too. Already cotton picking had been significantly mechanized drastically cutting de labor demand. Lettuce packing had been partially mechanized and moved from the packing shields to the fields, to packing sheds to the fields. But in this case, that significantly increased labor demand. And in the canning tomato crops by 1963, some 25 new mechanical harvesters have been deployed, picking one half of 1% of the canning tomato harvest 
uh, that year. A year later, there were 70 machines, and in 1965, after the Bracero program ended, 262 machines were at work on 30% of the harvest. More than 900 machines were deployed by 1966. And even more, the resurgent AWOC had helped give birth and then give way to the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee headed by Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Larry Itliong, and others destined to become famous in California labor history. A union that, as it evolved into the United Farm Workers, found a new, more fertile ground for organizing now that the Bracero program had come to an end. Perhaps the revolution in the California landscape was finally at hand. And yet, even in the wake of all of this upheaval, the agribusiness landscape, what Kerry McWilliams had long ago called the pattern, persisted. Even as the mid-1960s represented a critical moment in what economists like to call labor market adjustment. It's so bloodless, isn't it? Uh, and even as significant new trends were put into place, including, for example, the early movement by some California growers of agricultural production out of California into low-wage Mexico, and with that, the beginning of a significant long-term and ultimately successful campaign to completely rewrite the treaties governing trade between the two countries. This is the roots of the Mecca-Kiodora program and then eventually NAFTA. Particularly noteworthy in this regard was asparagus production. In the San Joaquin Delta, heartland of American uh, asparagus production, as you all, I'm sure, knew, half the labor force was comprised of braceros in the final year of the program. They were particularly heavily used in white asparagus production, an incredibly labor and capital intensive crop. Overall, all in the Delta, 15,000 acres were taken out of uh, asparagus production in anticipation of and consequent to the loss of the braceros. By 1971, white bracero production had completely disappeared from California and therefore from the United States and asparagus acreage was only 55% and asparagus production only 65% of their post-war peak in the late 1950s. By the end of the 1970s, these had declined even further to 34 and 45% respectively. The reasons why seem obvious. Between 1955 and 1960, the peak of both asparagus production and the use of braceros in the asparagus fields in California, wages for work in white asparagus did not budge from 325 per hundredweight. In 1961, as the struggle to end the Bracero program intensified, they began to rise, reaching 410 in 1964. But with the end of the program, they skyrocketed, reaching $8 by 1970. Less labor-intensive green asparagus wage rates also grew, though more slowly. Offshoring of asparagus production, especially white asparagus production, to Mexico made obvious sense, especially since in both its fresh and its canned form, it is a vegetable that travels well. Michael Pollan notwithstanding. Uh, he had a famous article about asparagus from Chile at one point. Increased mechanization, as with canning tomatoes, the flight to Mexico, as with asparagus and increasingly with lettuce, a shift to sharecropping systems as with strawberries and even um, as with strawberries and even experiments with, believe it or not, cultivating a permanent, relatively well-paid labor force valued for its skills, as in the lemon uh, industry. The end of the Bracero program ushered in a period of rapid restructuring of labor relations, labor processes, and the very nature of work. The calculus upon which growers made decisions regarding, the production, uh, regarding production and labor, a calculus that now had to also include a growing labor militancy catalyzed by the UFW, was altered. There is no doubt then that the demise of the Bracero program ushered in restructured labor relations. It also ushered in at least a partial restructuring of the labor force. But it hardly portended the end of exploitative labor relations in California. For despite real fears of a radical transformation of the California landscape as the U.S. entered World War II, what the Bracero program did over its 22 years was allow agribusiness to cement its control so that by the end of the program, it was simply inconceivable that the industry could be restructured in any fundamental way. All the adjustments that I just named, after all, were capital-driven, more the result of growers safeguarding their investments and interests than changes forced politically. 
Indeed, for all the tumult of the first post-Bracero year, 1965, that very year agriculture made, in the words of a uh, state report, the largest contribution in history to the total economy of California, which itself had reached an all-time high with the rate of growth accelerating as the year progressed. And California harvest comes late in the year. In 1986, 22 years after the Bracero program ended, that is a stretch of time exactly equivalent to the duration of the program itself, geographer James Parsons argued that nothing has changed the structure of San Joaquin Valley agriculture so much as mechanization. At the same time, the agricultural labor question is always the crucial one in the valley. The social system remains reminiscent of the plantation south with a class of ethnically distinct and socially inferior manual laborers that has proved to be highly impervious to union organizing. Wage rates are high in comparison to other parts of the country, but employment is limited for most persons to several summer months each year. Dependence on welfare and food stamps is high. Much the same argument could have been made, and in fact was, in 1966, 1936, 1916, instead of 1986. And it can still be made now, except we're not in a year that ends with six. The earliest braceros were imported as a means of preserving a set of prerogatives and privileges California growers took to be both natural and necessary, as well as to protect and realize the perceived values stored in or made possible by the agricultural landscape. Braceros changed social relations, but they also preserved them. post bracero transformations of the labor process likewise were geared toward preserving dominant relations rather than fundamentally restructuring them. What is most remarkable about the post bracero landscape is how little changed fundament fundamentally it was from the pre bracero landscape. An epoch of labor relations, the Bracero era, a time when labor relations operated on a markedly different basis than before or after, in fact marked an epoch more of continuity than of change. So what can we make of all of this? Geography sculpts the future, for sure, but where does that geography, that landscape, come from? How is it produced? What is it? Just what gives things on the land, to take a standard geographical definition of the landscape, their shape and structure, their power to sculpt the future. Historical geographer Rich Schein defines the landscape as discourse materialized. Drawing on Jim Duncan, Schein defines discourse as those shared meanings which are socially constituted ideologies or sets of common sense assumptions. Any discourse is a social framework of intelligibility within which all practices are communicated, negotiated, and challenged. This has implications for how we understand the produced landscape. Each seemingly individual decision behind any particular US landscape is embedded within a discourse. When the action results in a tangible landscape element or a total ensemble, the cultural landscape becomes the discourse materialized. Examples of such discourses might include zoning theory and practice, architectural trends, economic consumption patterns, and others. But landscape is not passive, merely a receptacle of, receptacle of discourse, as it were. Rather, as a material component of a discourse or a set of intersecting discourses, the cultural landscape at once captures the intent and the ideology of the discourse and is constitu a constituent part of its ongoing development and reinforcement. This is obviously true. The historical geography of the Bracero era makes this abundantly clear, that the struggles in fields and labor camps in the state were waged the level of discourse through which meanings were constructed. In my book, I devote hundreds, actually 500 pages, to analyzing these discourses. Discourses that concerned everything from how farmers saw themselves as always economically squeezed by more powerful financial actors, to discourses about the specific racial fitness of Mexicans to do farm work, and from the putative role of farm workers' ignorance of the basic needs of public health, safety, and, sa uh, sanitation, and sanitation as a cause for the crappy labor camp conditions, and on to the, assisted right, uh, the asserted rights of workers to strike. But to say that the myriad actions of growers, workers, state agents, and the rest in California that resulted in shaping and reshaping the transformation and simultaneous preservation of the landscape were embedded in discourse, and that therefore landscape is discourse materialized, is to say not nearly enough. Discourse is too thin of a concept to bear the weight placed on it. 
what was always at stake in the making, remaking, and defense of the California landscape during the Bracero era was not only a social framework of intelligibility. We need other ways, I think, to understand the morphology of landscape and the practices entwined with it. If nothing else is apparent from the history of the Bracero era in California, and especially of the demise of the Bracero program, it is that creating and maintaining a productive capitalist farming landscape, agribusiness as it came to be in the 20th century, together with the labor processes and systems of social reproduction that make such a landscape possible, was always a struggle. Nothing was guaranteed. Not from day to day, not from year to year, and certainly not across the whole era. Rather, the spatial arrangements that made production and reproduction possible had constantly to be formed. This is not to say that individual agents call the landscape into being as they make it relevant for their own lives, projects, and strategies, as geographers like Mitch Rose so solipsistically assert. Nothing could be further from the truth. The landscape is already there and it persists. It shapes the conditions of possibility for its own reproduction as well as that of the processes, pe people, and events within it, its own future. Each individual decision that makes and remakes or just uses and reuses the landscape is not only embedded within discourse, it is also a product of a history of struggles and practices, of ways of doing things, of the specific mandates of capital circulation and the logic of competitive capitalist production, of power. Landscape is power materialized. Decisions, as the end of the Becerro program showed, were embedded within a never-ending history of struggle. Struggle with nature, struggles between capital and labor, struggles within the state, struggles engaged by actors possessing different levels of power and differing abilities to shape the context within which they had to operate. To reduce such struggles to discourse too easily abstracts away from these relations of power and control, too easily turns attention from the issues of who is able to structure the landscape to meet their own needs and desires, to protect their own interests, and to sculpt for themselves what might be a good future. Landscape incorporates this history of struggle, development, and change. That's precisely what it is, as Rich Schein, in fact, has made quite clear in recent work. Landscape is the history of struggles over its form and its meaning and its function because landscape is a primary facilitator and mediator of particular political, social, economic, and cultural intentions and debates, in Rich Schein's words, but also of particular political, social, economic, and cultural processes. But if that is the case, then we have to be attentive to what, to what does not appear in the landscape, what is not apparent in its morphology, such as the very traces of less powerful groups that can be erased, wiped out, their struggles simply not materialized in the landscape. This too is an effect of power. And in making this claim, I don't think that there is a need for a very sophisticated theory of power. There's no need to worry about whether it is capillary or somehow productive rather than just prohibitive. Rather, power to me is always an empirical question. Who is able to act and how? How are they able to act? What is the place uh, that makes their, what is, what is in place that makes their action possible? To what end are they acting? Yet there is a need to remember that power is not only the possession of individuals, groups, classes, institutions, or social relations like capital or the state. Power is the ability to affect something, as the shorter Oxford English Dictionary phrases it. The morphological landscape is structured through contested social relations practices, but in turn, recursively, it shapes or affects those social relations, establishing the terms of contestation or the terms of just getting on. Landscape is power materialized, but power is the landscape operationalized. Even when accounting for all the propaganda, all the ideology at the heart of the growers' arguments about why domestic and family labor at the end of the Becerro era was unsuited to harvest work in California, it was indubitably the fact that distinct elements in the landscape had been altered. Their form shifted precisely to exclude family labor so as to better preserve the larger landscape ensemble that was the California agri was California agribusiness. The landscape was thus not only dead labor, as I've defined it in other work, it was dead labor with effects, precisely what Marx meant when he asserted that under capitalism, dead labor comes to dominate living labor, for it is now the former, dead labor, that establishes the conditions that make the latter, living labor, possible, rather than the other way around. Landscape persists. That is its prospect. In this view, landscape is dynamic 
and fluid, but especially as power materialized, it is solid and all the more precarious for that. So, thank you. <laughs> Santa liked it. When the federal government uh, built up in the huge hydraulic uh, uh, project, and it was in the 30s, yeah. and it was promoted for giving a world to the American citizens, yeah. my question is, do you think the federal government had this idea, the connection between the Bracero project and this uh, water project to yeah. the to not quite that clearly, right? But they certainly had the uh, sense that by developing these water projects, right, it was going to open up a lot more of the landscape for agribusiness, particularly the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, with that, uh, a much larger army of labor was going to be needed. So there was always that question there. But there were huge fights within the New Deal government, the 1930s government, into World War II, in fact, about who that labor should be. And the Farm Security Administration, which ran the uh, Bracero program for the federal government in its first year, uh, the growers got it pushed out in 1943, but in its first year, was uh, really, really pushing. In fact, they were, many of the people in the Farm Security Administration were, uh, were arguing and working against the, um, the Bracero program, the origins of it, the beginnings of it, uh, really fighting it because there was a, a huge amounts of unemployment still of farm workers in California at the time that the first Braceros arrived. So they were, they were pushing against it. Farm workers were, uh, far, farmers were working really hard to uh, bring them in. There was the acknowledgement that an increased labor force was going to need, be needed, but what it was going to be, who it was going to be, was uh, very much a, a struggle, right? It was very up in the air. Growers, for their part, ever since, well, they, they, they run hot and cold. So in World War I, uh, uh, they recruited lots of Mexican workers from Mexico. Me Mexican and Mexican-Americans had not been a large part of the labor, agricultural labor force in California before World War I. Uh, but they became fairly large then, and, and the Mexican gov government did everything they could to actually uh, stem emigration during World War I. World War I to the United States and many of its citizens uh, because of the highly exploitative uh, way that labor operated in California and Texas in particular. So um, once the war ended, um, growers thought they had a naturally suited labor force to doing this work, and so they assiduously continued recruiting Mexican workers. But in 1933, of course, we're behind much of the so-called repatriation uh, that begins in uh, the Depression. And as soon as they're done doing that, and the reason they're doing that is because 33 is the great upheaval. It's the year of the biggest strikes in California history, and they were radical Mexican, Mexican-American workers for the most part who were striking. And so the growers really start pushing for deportation right after that, and then want them back again in 40 too, but under these controlled conditions at the same time. So they, they run hot and cold. So who that labor force is going to be is always up for grabs. That it's necessary, understood to be necessary, is uh, not up for grabs. So there's a lot of talk about where will we get the workers, but it wasn't necessarily this program that would do it. They want the wine. Good thing I didn't bring the talk where I talk about exploitation of grape workers. So this might just be like a factually based question. Uh -huh. I'm curious if there was any relationship that you discovered between the 1965 immigration law mm -hmm. and the end of the Bracero program. Yeah, the end of the Bracero program uh, forced in some ways, in uh, part. Yeah, that, that, was, yeah. that was like the yeah, yeah, chapter yeah. that I was, yeah. I was waiting to hear, mm -hmm. and I wasn't sure if that was it. So public law 414 uh, gets uh, rewritten pretty strongly. Uh, in 65, and I don't know all the details of this particularly well. In 65, um, things is all uh, wrapped up in debates over the end of, of this program. There's a lot of pressure from the Mexican government uh, uh, around these things because they're, uh, they're facing the loss of remittances, they're facing political unrest in the wake of this. So the border industrialization program comes out of that moment as well. And, um, and so there's, um, yeah, so there is a real rethinking uh, of immigration, immigration at that, of immigration policy right at that moment. I'm, just, I'm thinking internationally in terms of, do you know, I mean, I'm going to go to the Arab world again, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so shocked to hear this. You already know. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had a whole class on the Arab Spring. 
<laughs> but I mean, obviously, like seeing those images of um, the workers' houses and so on, like just obviously brings up yeah. Dubai. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, do, do you, are there any direct parallels? Or? Oh yeah, absolutely. I was at a conference about um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, organized by the historian Matt Garcia, who's, who's fantastic, and uh, as at the Huntington Library in, in um, Southern California. And it was called um, Guest Workers. Uh, American Origins Global Futures. And um, a number of us, I mean, I, I haven't looked at this in a global context much, but Matt has, and others have. Uh, you're pretty convinced that this is the model for global, the Becerra program is the model for global guest worker programs. And there are a number of folks at this conference who gave absolutely fantastic uh, talks and looking at places like Dubai, uh, but all over the place too. I mean, is, is, Israel's the, the same. Um, uh, all, and now um, in, in the United States, uh, this is a dirty little secret that no one talks about, there's a, a rather large program to import um, uh, uh, guest working teachers, right? The guest working nurses have been around forever, right? Uh, and uh, there's now global market in guest worker teachers that is developing. And a lot of them are modeled on it. Some of the international agreements between Mexico and um, and the U.S. Are, are particularly important because they have a set of formal guarantees of rights to the workers, right? Uh, and that's all they ever were, were formal guarantees. Uh, but, uh, but they were there. And th there's all this language about prevailing wages and, and so forth and so on gets picked up again in, in guest worker programs all over the world. So, so there, there seems to be a real um, connection. I, I was in California a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I did uh, three talks for the Alumni Association of Syracuse University. Uh, you know, so donors, right? Uh, <laughs> financial capitalists, farmers, those kinds of people, some students. And the talk was called, Are We All Braceros Now? And I ended it, you know, I talked a little bit about the history of the program, and I ended it by saying, you know, this model of uh, indentured labor, I spent a lot more time in that talk talking about why I call it indenture, which is a word from an economist, uh, Lloyd Fisher, at the time, and in what ways it's indentured and so forth, and how it is in many ways uh, becoming a predominant form of labor relations globally now. Uh, that um, precariousness of labor, I, I talk a lot about the contracts uh, there. Uh, contracts are six weeks, but they could be renewed a number of times. They were really only supposed to be renewed once, but growers would get exceptions. They keep people there permanently, but on six weeks co contracts, because you never know when someone's going to become a joker, to quote a lemon grower, uh, or a labor agitator. And, uh, and so you can get rid of them. So there's that model, the importing of people, the separating out of families, the importance of remittances, and so forth. I think it's becoming a predominant form of labor issues. I and mean, we know it in the university, right? <laughs> Don't we? <laughs> right? And the dual labor market aspects of it as well. We all know that. This Bracetto program was for 22 years. Yeah. At the end of it, was every, all the Bracettos were reported. Nope. Uh, they were sent home, not necessarily deported. Their contracts, <laughs> their contracts ran out, which meant they had to leave, right? And there were um, buses and trains and everything else to take them. Over the whole course of the Bracero program, hundreds of thousands, I would guess, certainly tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of Braceros jumped their contracts, right? And stayed illegally in the United States. Hundreds of thousands of others gained a huge amount of knowledge. Right? Some gained money and went back to wherever they were from and started small businesses or bought more land or you know, did you know, all kinds of things happened. But a lot gained a lot of knowledge. So both during the, the uh, program and after, many came across uh, undocumented uh, because they now had the knowledge. They knew the labor contractors. They knew the labor associations. Uh, they knew the places. Right? They, they were skilled in particular labor processes. You know, all those kinds of things. They were a very desirable labor force. So one reason, the, the growers cried murder through all, all the way from 61 to, to 66, really. Then they got pretty quiet. I mean, they were fighting the UFW. And, and one reason they got pretty quiet is they found that they could uh, actually get all the braceros that they wanted. Only now they were getting them under uh, conditions that, weren't ev that didn't even formally guarantee their rights. What they got was something better. Right? Um, the nice thing about the Becerra program, why a lot of farmers like it still, and like those kind of guest worker programs, is it's predictable. Right? And it's more manageable. Uh, and you can, um, you can plan a bit better than if you're dealing with an undocumented labor force. But the, rise of contra the increased use of contractors has helped take care of some of that in years since. So, um, so, so a lot of, of Becerra's did go home. 
right? Um, Bracero wing, if that's what it's called, uh, became um, multi-generational in some families. So, um, you know, fathers and sons uh, would come and, you know, fathers by the end of the program, if they'd been early Braceros, would just stay, but their kids would come north. So uh, a, a range of things happened, but a lot didn't end up going back. And, and the U.S. did a lot to facilitate their return um, through a very big expansion of the green card program, something called white cards, which were daily commuters across the border into the Imperial Valley and the Yuma Valley, um, green carders, uh, and then through the really rapid expansion of the H-2 program in 65, which brought in a lot of expert heroes. Um, well, you know I'm interested in social reproduction. That's why I, I said that word so many times. I heard it, <laughs> and, I wanna, <laughs> and I like hearing it. But I'd like to hear it. I'd like to push you a little more to talk about okay. how it figures. I mean, yeah. for one thing, the landscape and the maintenance uh, of a mm -hmm. landscape of mm -hmm. production is part of social reproduction. Right. But also, there's an in, an interest in having cheaply reproduced yeah. labor yeah. Um, that right. I'd like to hear you. Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the things that's going on and has, has been going on in California since industrialized agriculture began in 18, no, 1770, whenever Junipero Cerro came across, uh, was importing labor, right? Labor importation has been central to California's development. Uh, first, uh, well, first enslavement, enslavement of Indians, and then uh, importation uh, from, from China, from Japan, from the Philippines, uh, until growers realized that since the Philippines were a colony, they couldn't deport Filipinos. And, uh, and, then, um, and then Mexico and farther south in Central America and so forth, right? And from the east and from Northeast Europe. And part of the reason for that is that the reproduction costs, right, are born elsewhere. Right, or at least a big piece of the reproduction costs. Now, this is a nice thing about cyclical labor from Mexico, an even bigger piece of the reproduction costs are born elsewhere. I mean, you can figure remittances into it and try and figure out how much that is, but a pretty big piece of taking care of old people, of taking care of young people, of all the family labor, of all the other kinds of labor that's unpaid and so forth takes place elsewhere, right? And that's been crucial to California. California is not economically self-sustaining and it never has been in agriculture. Uh, and so that's, that's one piece of it. Another piece of it is that um, under the Bracero program in particular, even though there are formal guarantees uh, of, around things like wages and also housing, housing had to be um, equivalent to that, uh, of the same standard to that provided domestic workers, right? Which is just a big joke because domestic workers were totally crap. Domestic workers could leave a job or they could uh, fight back in various ways. Berceros did fight back, but they were really limited in how, how they could. If a Bracero objected, they would be deported, right? So if they objected over living conditions, which they actually did quite a lot, or over food and so forth, they were frequently deported, so, which had an effect of really often, unless there was other pressures at work, pushing down the standards of work. Growers had lots of ways of justifying this. You know, they, they argued that, uh, I mean, I'm not making this up either, they argued in 1957, 1958, in a series of hearings, that Mexicans simply did not know how to use flush toilets and couldn't learn, right? Uh, and so they pushed those lines um, and so forth. But so they, they would drive down, you know, just for the bodily, re, you know, bodily reproduction needs. Uh, and the same, same with food, there are all kinds of scams around the food and so forth. And so, so all of that was, right. so I think that dual thing of being able to use a, a highly controlled labor force to drive down conditions, right, drive down wages and to force out all these displaced persons, the domestics, while also uh, offloading a number of the reproduction costs across a border, right, was, was crucial to it. Does that get at some of Yeah, anything? I mean, yeah. no need to provide schools, yeah. no need to provide, but also right. the housing, family housing in the fields right. is not Family housing in the fields is not necessary, and of course it's a great deal for the Mexicans because now they can get radio antennas, right? They can come home. Another thing I'm not making up with new Stetsons and negligees, and um, <laughs> archival work's fun, folks. <laughs> you learn these things, <laughs> and so um, uh, yeah. So you know all those things, right? Because of the the uneven development between the, the two countries. Absolutely. When I finished my, my dissertation, uh, it, it went from 19th 
2013 when there was a big uh, riot in California in, in a place called Wheatland to 1942, which is the beginning of the Bracero program. And if that book's long, my dissertation was even longer. And I had to end it somewhere, uh, Neil kept telling me. And so uh, it was uh, going to be labor relations changed drastically on September 29, 1942 in California. And, um, and so I, um, so I, I always thought I wanted to continue and figure out what happened and learn the history myself and, and those sorts of things. But I also had an argument in my earlier work. The argument was that landscape is a function, if you want, of the struggles between labor, capital, and the state. Right? So if you change drastically one of those elements, right, uh, then uh, the landscape will change drastically. So I wanted to see in the next period how it changed. Right? What I came to was, in essence, a partial refutation of what I was arguing in that earlier book, that, in fact, persistence Right? Even though there's this massive change in one of those elements, this ongoing change in one of those elements, is equally as important as the kind of change. It was not nearly as simple as I kind of set it up at one place in the lie of the land. And so that, that intellectual journey to me was really fascinating. But I thought I was going to be able to just tell the story and talk about how labor relations had really changed and therefore you know, look, you know, how the landscape is consolidated, which it had, right? and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the story that I found was a, a lot more difficult. And then someday, I want to do the UFW period, right? Uh, and then, uh, since I keep getting older and time keeps going on, I'll do whatever period you know comes out. It'll be about a 22-year chunk again, and um, <laughs> and so I will, um, you know, it'll keep me busy for a long time. Part of I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I, I love doing archival work. I'm really fascinated by California agriculture. I uh, have been since I was a little kid, and um, so, you know, I just kind of. Should we continue this discussion over drinks and food? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.